City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. My name's John. I'm in the comm center with Drew Breezy. Between the two of us, we have over 100 years of combined law enforcement experience. Uh, on Comm Center, we, uh, we we break down small cases in the big case style, and we talk about uh, creepy and terrible things in a rather lighthearted way. Drew, what's going on with you this week? I don't know. I'm just, uh, I thought I had everything prepared and, and settled down. We've actually, you and I have been on uh, this uh, stream getting ready to go live since about 3.30 in the morning this morning. Actually, it was 3.30 yesterday morning. We're actually at, at about 30 <laughs> hours now. And well, I'm not, no. I don't know anything about the international date line, but I, the thing is, um, I, I'm, I, I'm, uh, like we, we just, you just saw what, a second ago when I showed, I showed the, the big screen of our calls and our callers and stuff, uh, because I'm sharing the screen and whatnot. The, the pro the issue I'm having is, um, I really wanted to share some stuff from what I have in front of me. Uh, but apparently I'm not going to be able to do that. But but what I do have are a set of voicemails from last week's stuff. So last week's case was the big case breakdown of the worst 911 tantrum call ever. We got about nine voicemails. Unfortunately, if we just have nine play, then we'll just put them on now. And Drew and I will go home for the night. And I'm not sure that's what we want to do for tonight's show. No, it isn't what we want to do for tonight's show. What what we do want to do is remind you that you can call us at 848-COM-911. That's 848-266-6911. And you can call us at any point. You can call us uh, at 2 in the morning on a Tuesday when you're driving around uh, searching for that open uh, convenience store to take a leak or whatever you're doing. But you can call us at any point 24-7, leave us a voicemail. You can also call us right now. I, I think tonight's show is going to be a... a significant uh breakthrough if i could if we can get things straightened out ironed out but uh i, I think it's going to be a, a hell of a show we have uh, what we're going to do is review some uh video and audio call from an austin pd officer involved shooting we have uh it was kind of a famous shooting the kid the kid or the the man that died was a millionaire not that that has anything to do with that i think he had uh some uh very uh, intense mental health problems. I don't know that to be factual, but it, it kind of, excuse me, kind of suggests uh, his behavior kind of suggests that he did. Um, and we're going to break all that down. Let's, let's it's, listen. To it's definitely a case for everyone. If you're a police officer, this is going to be one where you're going to want to ring in. Uh, you're going to want to have your say on maybe whether or not you would have done something differently. If you're a 911 dispatcher, you're going to want to maybe say, should a different question have been asked on that call? And if you're just someone that wants to talk to Josh Deadleg Media, he's our call screener tonight. He's kind of in the background back behind this brick wall, and uh, he's uh, taking your calls tonight. Thank you, Deadleg. So uh, can you do me a favor, John? I'm going to hit play on this and give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Uh, never mind. It's not playing, so. Oh, okay. Uh, how many times did we rehearse this? Or oh, here we go. Here we go. Hello, Com Center. This is Micah, aka Sarge, probably soon to be Corporal. Just checking in on you guys. Nice to talk to you, you this afternoon. Give you guys an update. Uh, upcoming child with the initials D O M M uh, is still due on February 1st. Everything's track. And looking forward to uh, Com Center tomorrow night. Guns up, giddy up. Okay. Now that baby was born on January 20th. <laughs> I was going to say, wait a second. Did my ears deceive me? Uh, yes, he, his his child is obviously named after our show, John. See, yeah, his yeah. daughter is uh, Charles Ocean Mary Mary, which I thought was very, very brave. Yeah, I, I find that brave as well. Uh, okay, so we're going to do a two-parter here. Uh, kind of funny. Ready? Hey, Drew and crew. Uh, just calling to say, uh, like the show so far, just finished with the episode, uh, what is it? The worst temper tantrum over 911. 
uh, pretty good. Uh, I'm a serving uh, officer, uh, so I won't give away too much information. But I was laughing as I, oh, it's currently quarter after one a.m. I'm on shift right now on Sunday night. Um, but yeah, so uh, it made me. I don't know how long these recordings last, but it made me think of one call that I had uh, a couple of years back, and uh, you guys were talking about uh, charging someone for misuse of nine one one. Uh, where I work, there's the 911 Act, and uh, I think there's Section 8 is uh, frivolous or uh, something frivolous um, calls of uh, 911 or something like that. And the dispatchers just hand, handled that one really well. We were there's this guy dealing with some mental health issues, I think, and uh, he was kept on calling, just being super lonely. And, uh, he called 911 about eight times and, um, our dispatch is called OCC operational communication center. So he kept on calling OCC and, uh, there was one time where he was put on hold and they got a hold of us on the radio and they're like, he's calling back again. So we started heading out that way. He lives in a rural, rural property. <clears throat> and, uh, I got the 911 recordings, uh, for the trial. Um, it was really funny. Um, they were so good. Uh, the the uh, female dispatcher, because um, it's all recorded, she switched over after dealing with another person, and she could hear in one of his calls that he was put on hold. Was um, uh, he had told them that he would wait because he had a serious call, uh, but he didn't. All right, we're gonna finish that misuse nine one one story. So I found out. Yeah, just FYI, it, uh, the, the voicemail cut him off. So here's part two. Out that your recordings only last for two minutes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, when she swapped, this is a great story and all, uh, but I think there's a lesson for all of us to be learned, uh, here, uh, if it cuts you off at two minutes, that might be for a reason. Over to talk to him again. Uh, she could hear him talking to somebody else saying, oh yeah, I told him it's an emergency. Ha 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 ha. And, uh, I think when she switched over, she didn't initiate, uh, any conversation. She just wanted to listen in, which is very, you know, um, smart on her end, very tactical. And, uh, after she heard that and heard laughing, she says, uh, she pipes up and, uh, and says, you know, I can hear you. Right. And then he just like something changes. Like totally straight. That he goes, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. And then she says, so is there an emergency? He goes, uh, 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 and she says, is there an emergency? And he says, uh, no, ma'am. And he's like, and she said, uh, so you're going to keep calling us. And he's like, no, ma'am. <laughs> just a couple other things. This years ago, I'm just, uh, remembering off the top of my head, but anyway, it was very funny. Um, ended up not going out there, but serving them documents a couple of days later. Um, just and then OCC got over the phone and, and said over the radio and said, "Can I give you a 1021?" And I was like, "Yeah," which is a, a, phone, a call. phone call. Yeah. Uh, she calls me and she tells me all this. And anyway, just super funny, super professional on there. And but uh, yeah, because I'm the crazy craziness and. He had been doing that for a while, so we decided to charge him with that and um, public mischief for filing false police uh, reports as well. So, yeah, anyway, uh, good show. Keep it up. Uh, hey. Fantastic story. Did uh, did he identify where he was from, John? Not only did he not identify it, but I think he may have used his uh, police-issued phone because on uh, a lot of times when people call us, we could see your numbers, which, by the way, we're not going to release to anyone if you're nervous about calling and we 911 dispatchers are and police officers i'm sure are worried about that but his number was blocked so we have no way we cannot like pretend this is the fugitive and listen to the l trains in the background we can't analyze his voice or anything we just need to enjoy his story and not try to figure out where he's from that was a wonderful story by the way um please don't forget to call us at 848-COM-911 and tell us your stories here's one more for you kind of weird that i got a voicemail for a non-emergency line but uh I'm not one to call about this. I got two cars parked outside, uh, passing something between the drivers. Uh, it kind of looks pretty suspicious. If you could send someone over to check it out, uh, that'll be great. Oh, wait, uh, one of the cars is moving slowly in the way. Let me, let me see if I can't get the plate number for you. All right, let's see, it's passing under the street light. Ooh, well, this is kind of awkward now. Seems it was just two officers passing a box of pizza between them. Ooh, he's eating a slice. What do you got? Oh, gosh, no. It's got pineapple on it. Oh, my God. Well, I'm 10-6, John. 
Sorry to bother you, Wolfpack. Oh! Uh, as always, Wolfpack comes through. Oh! That was awesome. By the way, you could just do that all the time. Unburden yourself with your stories from real life. That that was so real. It was uh, terrifically funny. Uh, I have to tell this story about one of my coworkers who uh, went out to the park after a shift to smoke a cigar because that's how I relieve stress. He goes out there and he's in the park and he's just smoking a cigar. Well, somebody in a house nearby called him in as two people doing a drug deal in a car. So <laughs> that just shows you what people know. <laughs> Uh, I, there is a legendary story that happened here in this county, and I know that it's happened in other places where uh, two uh, undercover cops who are working like vice crimes uh, kind of tried to, uh, let's just say they met in a George Michael Memorial washroom in a public park, and uh, they tried to undercover solicit one another, and it just uh, kind of like face off. It just went on for hours and hours sounds like the worst game of chicken i've ever heard <laughs> it's absolutely because there are no winners in that in that game uh look i think i've got something uh correct here for once in my life and I, i'm going to read a caption to you first this is off of instagram it's from uh one of the accounts that i happen to follow i give them full cr credit it's called behind the shield 911 and this uh, video is starting to go viral. I think it was the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, or it was somewhere here in South Florida. But this is the uh, the touching part of this, and I'll show you the, the the video in a second. The touching part of this is the the caption that behind the shield uh, nine one one road. It said, "Dispatchers, the unsung dispatchers are the unsung heroes of the first responder profession. They spend twelve hours in the dark, sitting in a chair." responding to people's emergencies. They listen to the last breaths of dying patients, the screams of domestic abuse victims, the walls of parents who just lost a child. And unlike responders, they don't get to see the outcomes and they don't get to physically try and save a life. So whilst firefighters and police officers have a physical outlet, whether it's extricating and entrapped victims from a wreck or police foot pursuit, perhaps, dispatchers have no way of offloading the stress from a call. So to our dispatchers, he says, thank you. This really was from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And uh, it says, uh, Nancy Mackey, after 40 years of service as a communications officer, has decided to retire. God bless her. This was her reaction to a special send-off they did in her honor after decades to, of service to the community of Palm Beach County. Happy retirement, Nancy. We wish you the same. And we're going to show this to you with any luck, right now, maybe not. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful tribute. This is, yeah, it is. It is uh, for you, those of you listening at home, it's just a gray screen with some pixels on it. I'm sure the sheriff <laughs> ran is. basically a printer test and came out and showed it to her. This is for you, Nancy. It's interpretive art. And it is yet another example of how rude uh, cops are. The whole thing was sarcastic. Can you believe it? I, I don't know. I, I'm at a loss here. I, I really don't know what uh, what happened. But we're going to remove that. And we're going to. What was the name of the account? Just so uh, that people can go look at it. Hold on a second. It's called Behind the Shield 911. But we're going to we're going to try this one more time. We're not giving. Let's up. try it one more time. Sarcastically, at least. Yeah, sure. Okay, hold on a second. I don't know what... Uh, I'll talk technical stuff while you do this. So, like, printers will, like, print out a test page so that, like, lasers can get lined up. So you have to you have to print the thing and then scan it. <laughs> this thing is so fickle, it's not even funny. A anyway, a dispatcher somewhere sometime was thanked for 40 years of service. And Nancy, if you're out there listening... That's amazing. Uh, I'm telling you that, that, that there's a greater issue that I'm dealing with here when it comes to this. And, and you know, I'll just be frank with you. I'm, we use a, a, an application called StreamYard, and StreamYard's kind of fickle, uh, to say the least. And um, for some reason, it's not letting me do what I needed to do. And the problem with that is, John, as you know, oh, wait a minute. The problem with that is, as you know, 
is that <laughs> the YouTube videos are going to be the exact same. We're going to be in this the exact same situation. Look at this. Look look what look what Drew guys did. zoom in real 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 close. <laughs> what you're what you're not seeing at home. Good. This is what they did. I mean, I know it's great pod. Okay, so what they did was they hold on. It comes out. Where are they going? I hope nothing's happening in here. Where are they going? He's like, what is going on? He's coming out for her last shift. And all of these officers have lined up and turned on their lights. And then it hits you like a ton of brick. Don't make me cry. She knows it's for her now. She noticed. She now knows it's for her. She immediately starts crying. And what I found most poignant about this is not only was she not expecting it, she gives off the vibe that she doesn't feel like she deserves it. Yeah. But we all know that to be not... Well, this is what we all want as 911 dispatchers, whether you're there for nine years or you're there for 10. When you leave, you want to generate a noise complaint. You want it to be for you. Yeah, right. Those cops lit up that neighborhood and sirens, I'm sure, were heard for miles around. And I'm sure it annoyed the, the co-workers that had to relieve her so that she could go 10-7 for the last time. I'm sure the phones all lit up. What's going on? Why, why is the whole fifth cavalry of police officers outside? So that was, yeah. that was really the, nice. The other half complained that... Um they didn't get to go outside themselves. Yeah. You know and so um, I just love that. She was genuinely curious. She's like, Oh my gosh, what's going on? And she almost had this, like, should I go back in there? Like her, her step stopped. Like, should I go back in there for something really awful? And then uh, she turned to the camera person and she gave him a look like, you know, don't you dare put any attention on me. Cause you know, other than me and drew dispatchers kind of despise attention. So that was, that was really a nice tribute. Right. We can't all be attention whores like John and I. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're just going to get right into this thing. I, I don't see any reason why not. John, do you have anything else to discuss? No, but uh, we can put in the comments to start listening at uh, 20 minutes after because that's when the show starts. Okay, so this is what we're going to get into now. Did you talk about um, Clayton, North Carolina, by chance? I was going to mention that at the end. Uh, so <laughs> failure. We'll do that. We'll mention at the end. Yeah, it's a tease. Okay. So stick around, everybody, and wait to hear at the end what John has to say about. The Maybe I won't say it, but you should still stick around. Yeah, right. But you know. All right, let's break down this case, Drew. Okay, so to set the stage, understand that this is November fifteenth of twenty twenty two. So we're not talking too far long ago. I'm going to give another producer credit to my friend Abby Ellsworth who has a podcast of her own. It's called On Being a Police Officer. She's a wonderful human being. She has very good guests. She has phenomenal guests. And uh, that's a foreshadowing as well. And um, she she was genuinely curious. What what Abby does is she's a civilian who interviews law enforcement, and she, she really wants to know. Like, she just wants to know what, what's going through our minds or what's, what's happening. And listen... Let, let's not pull any punches. We're we're about to go through a very rough period in our uh, in, in our careers again uh, with all of this stuff that's happening in Memphis. If you're not following along, five officers were charged with second degree murder today. Uh, one of them was charged with like kidnapping, and they're facing some very serious charges. They were already uh, fired from their jobs, and um, it's uh, once that video is released, I think. Uh, and again, I'm I am always an advocate of the truth, not necessarily 100%. The cops are right 100% of the time. I'm I am more of a, uh, I'm an advocate of the truth. And if they did something wrong, they're going to have to answer to it, uh, and a jury of their peers will decide that. And on top of that, um, it does it, it puts a stain on us if that's what happened. But I, I can't make a I can't make a call until I see the video. No, yeah, and, nor should you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we don't have full information. So everyone um, that is anti cop will call it or, or, or thinks that I'm a cop apologist or whatever. They always make this accusation like, Oh, that's such a cop out. Like no pun intended. That's a cop out. You're, you're just going to defend them at all costs. Nobody can ever do anything wrong, which isn't true. I just, I just honestly want to see the full video because unfortunately we're always, 
um, we're, we're always bombarded with the five second clip and we don't know what happened in the 30 minutes prior and the 30 minutes after. This is a very different situation. This is their actual body cams. And I think there's a neighbor that did some recording. And the, the picture that I saw of the um, the decedent. I, I do want to say, Drew, the officers in this case are not being treated fairly. Their names have already been released. Oh, yeah. And, and when I was doing research for this, I found that there was a YouTube on it, which when I clicked it, took me to a clip from the NBC Nightly News. When you Googling it, you know, NBC knows they're not going to get anyone to watch it. But when I watched it, uh, NBC Nightly News left out quite a bit. So I thought it was maybe more par for the course. Well, let, let's let's talk about it just a little bit here. Let's crack the egg. The, 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 the decedent is a black male and it's five black officers. So whether it's not meeting the media's criteria uh, for true police brutality, uh, it, it's kind of a test to see if, if they're really concerned about race, because as you know, uh, these articles come out. It's always about the race of the officer and the race of the person that's killed. And that that is actually a decider on how much coverage it's going to get. But Benjamin Crump, who is the civil rights attorney who's made lots of money um, making things into something. Um, and, and I don't know if he's going to be right on this one or not. Again, I haven't seen the video, but uh, he's already involved. And uh, I, I think once that video is released, I, I'm just very nervous about it. I, I have the feeling it's it's going to make uh, police officers across the United States look very bad. And I, and I don't know the whole story. And, uh, you know, I, I wish the officers the best. I wish uh, I, I'm sorry for the family of the decedent. Um, let's let's see how this plays out. That's there's a human being involved in this, obviously, that was killed. So uh, let's see how this plays out. So. As it relates to this case, um, the Austin police was very transparent in, in getting all this stuff out. So Abby asked me, she's like, I just really want to know what your take is on this, because as you'll see in the body worn camera video, it was um, like it was a it, it all happened very fast. So let's listen to the 911 call first, John, and then you can break down the 911 call. How about that? Let's do it. Austin 911, do you need police, fire, EMS or mental health services? Uh, police and possibly mental health. To what address or nearest cross street? 2301, uh, 2nd, or is this 3rd? Uh, I forget. Fletcher. 2nd and Fletcher, I believe. Oh, okay. And is it a house, duplex, or an apartment? Uh, these are houses. John, in your experience, what is uh, what is the level of experience of the dispatcher, just uh, the 911 emergency call taker? It's hard to tell because she's kind of locked into a, a really rigid protocol. Like when she starts, you know, she's trying to figure out how to route the call. I'm guessing Austin 911 probably has most of their services separated into what you might call a pod or a different group. So as she starts a call for service on her computer, she's going to type it as a certain type of emergency, which is going to alert other radio dispatchers. So she starts getting the address. She, like I said, she's pretty much locked into a protocol at this point. But a good dispatcher is someone who's going to ask what kind of dwelling this is. And in this case, it is a duplex, and that's absolutely critical for the rest of the story. Um, it's it's just my assessment that she's probably kind of new because she is very rigid with the, um, and it's it it's not indicative of repetition. She just she is typing and she's talking. She's definitely listening. I think she's doing a phenomenal job. But uh, and you'll hear. The, uh, here we go. Okay, and is it at, happening at twenty three hundred one South Third? Uh, no, it's across the street at a duplex on second. Across the street at duplex on second street. Okay. And what's your first name? It was redacted, I'm sure. Uh, there's a guy on the left side of the duplex approached me early. Okay. So uh, here's something I want to point out. And John, you know, jump in if you feel the need. Uh, the video itself is 59, uh, it's six minutes and 15 seconds long, but at, at the 59 second point, we are now getting to, hey, what's going on? This is another reason why I think that, that she might be new. Uh, 59, 59 seconds is a pretty critical time when you're dealing with a guy with a gun. I mean, you can get off 
I would agree. Um, you can you can see that she's processing in her mind, and you can hear the the clicks on her uh, type or her keyboard that she's you know putting that in. I don't know if she's using shorthand or if she's uh, just making sure that she gets really good details. This call is very good, but it is very slow, and so there's an argument there. You know, because it is so good, as the smooth, slow, and so slow is fast, as the saying goes. Yeah. Um, but what I will say for anyone who's just listening to that and thinking there's no way you can respond to an emergency, just remember a 911 call is coming in, uh, details are coming in. There's a second person there, a radio dispatcher, who's getting the information through the keyboard or, excuse me, the CAD, the computer, or also maybe just listening to the call. Um, I, I don't want anybody to think I'm being overly critical of this dispatcher. She's she's definitely doing a great job. And and here's the other kind of wrench in this thing, or not wrench, the curveball. Um, this guy is actually very calm, and and that's not a typical 911 call, especially a guy with a gun. And so we're going to get to the meat of what happened here or, or why he's calling, uh, but it's it, there's some pretty important words coming up. Thanks. approached me earlier today saying that he saw two suspicious people earlier. I was wanting to know if I saw them as well, and I hadn't. And he is currently running around outside with, I believe, a rifle. And, and he's just lifting it up to point and get down the street. Okay. So he's pointing a rifle down the street? Towards the yeah. Street? And currently he to go back inside. He's got all of his lights on now. All right, just another observation here, John. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, she's very calmly typing all this stuff as we're already talking about, but is is there not? Does that not work to our advantage when the dispatcher is calling? It always does. So you you're, you set the tone. If you're going to start getting upset, that's going to send a cue to the other person that maybe you know that they're in. in a higher level of danger that they are. I would say the caller is definitely in danger. If the person across the street from him has a rifle, um, he's a very, very good caller. He has a lot of detailed information. Obviously, law enforcement wants to know what kind of long gun that is. Knowing that it's a rifle is completely different than a shotgun, of course, when officers are approaching the scene. Uh, but he said something interesting. He said that he had encountered this person earlier today and that that person said that he was looking for someone. Now, sometimes when you get an information like this, and it's especially a, some kind of unknown trouble call at night, those things can really put a wrench into your thinking as a dispatcher because you're almost trying to solve a, pro a puzzle. It's almost like true crime in real time because you're, you something is happening, you're being told a story, you're trying to put yourself in the eyes and the shoes and the mind of the caller, and all of a sudden there's this weird context that the caller has saying, I saw him earlier today and he was looking for someone. True crime in real time is a great rhyme. He's inside the house now? Uh, he's standing in the doorway of his house. Okay. Does he still have the rifle? Yes. Is he pointing, does it look like he's pointing it at anyone? Uh, currently it's uh, at low ready. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this guy's got experience. He's got experience. Uh, does everybody in the chat know what low ready is? Does everybody listening on a podcast know what low ready is? I mean, if you're a cop, you probably do. If you're in the military, you probably do. Uh, generally, civilians don't. This guy knows what he's talking about, and um, the dispatcher is just plugging all that information into the call, which which I think has something to do with their reaction as well. And I'll talk about that in a second. So he's still watching. She's still, still typing. Yes, ma'am. Is he black, white, Hispanic, Asian? Uh, looks to be white. Could you see what color shirt? Uh, not a shirt. He's wearing a what is that garment called? A looks kind of like most of a robe. Okay, so can you see what color? It's gray. Gray, and you and see the robe. Dark pants. Okay. Does he appear to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol? Or you can't tell. Uh, couldn't say for drugs. He's definitely too coordinated for alcohol. 
great observation. That's really incredible. And the, the, the common person, you know, unless they interact with someone talking to them, they get the slurred speech, the bizarre behavior. They're not necessarily going to get that. But this guy could see he's behaving bizarrely, but he's well coordinated. Um, yeah, I think, too, in a dispatcher's mind or, or sometimes in a cop's mind, it's like, man, are they on drugs or alcohol? Meaning are they intoxicated? That's that, it's not an A or B question. It's just a it's a overall are they intoxicated? He breaks it down to say, yeah, he doesn't look sloppy drunk. He could be high, though, because of the way he's acting. I, I thought that was a great. Def definitely could affect the way that he listens to and understands verbal commands. Right. Definitely. Okay. And then does he appear to have a mental health issue? No idea. <laughs> but considering how paranoid he's acting, uh, it might be. Do you happen to know the name of the duplex, please? Uh, no, I wouldn't know the name of it. Okay. Okay, so what's your opinion? Did she hear his answer on that last question, which I think was critical? I'll play it again. Hold on. I'm going to rewind it like 10 seconds. And it's on Second Street, though. Oh, uh, maybe I missed it. Yeah. Across the street. And directly right. where Fletcher ends, right into Do the Do you mean the question right about whether or not, well, how he was behaving right kind of where? paranoid? Yes. It's because. such a strong word. Uh, paranoid, definitely, it, the connotations and implications of that word all of a sudden completely change what you're dealing with. You know, paranoid can be legitimate, of course, but it can also be, you know, a sign that somebody is uh, not completely all there. Right. But we have the benefit of hindsight. And, and so what I was, the point I was trying to make was he's saying um, he, he's still answering the question about mental health that she asked him. And, and he's like, yeah, he, he could be paranoid. And before he's done with his sentence, she says, what do you know if there are names to these duplexes, which, yeah, which is, that she is she has moved on. Yeah. She, she's doing her best to get the most information. It happens though sometimes, especially in a critical call like this, where you glance over information that is actually very important. It's not yeah. it's nobody's fault. It no. just it just happens that way. She's almost in a data entry mode when I yes. think what, what separates 911 dispatchers from sim simple data entry is that you can go through a protocol and you can ask things. And you sometimes you have some leeway that where you ask them, and sometimes you get fed a, a purse a piece of information that completely changes the way that you're going to handle it. Uh, you know, you're you're dealing with a patient, and he's uh, the patient has abdominal pain, and uh, you find out the sex of the patient is a male. Well, all of a sudden, any kind of complications from pregnancy go out the window. A lot of times, it can be diagnosing it like that. So this isn't a, as clear as that, of course, where you have an issue of paranoia, but there is no follow-up question. What makes you think he's paranoid? A simple open-ended question like that would be good. He's darting around. He's looking around the corner. He's shouting. Anything like that would have been helpful. Fletcher ends. Okay. So where Fletcher hit Second Street, is it on a corner? Fletcher Second? Uh, it's on the, uh, the top of the T, if you would. Like on Fletcher itself, there's 2301 on the left and an empty lot on the right, and then at the top of it is the duplex I'm talking yeah, are about. They, are they different colors by any chance? How would how would they know? Which, is there a car in the in the side or how would they? Know uh, which? there is a car on the right side of the duplex, and they'll see what me. Color? Uh, I uh, can't tell. It's dark, and they don't have lights on over there. It's a sedan? Uh, yeah, it looks like a four-door. But you don't know what color? Yeah. Okay. For all that, he keeps turning all of his lights on and off. They don't provide enough light to tell what color is over there. Okay. They'll see me in a uh, gray four-door sedan at 2301 itself. Okay. This is where it gets interesting. It's not that there was. Is he? Um, oh, second right ask here. Sorry, I lost my question. Um, 
Now she's uh, she's out of order now, and she's you discombobulated. He's scared of something inside of his home. Oh, you say he's turning his lights on and off? Yeah, the outside light. It looks like he's currently pointing his rifle at the interior of his home. So he's now pointing it inside his home? Yeah, it looks like. Oh, he just fired. He fired out to the street? He fired into his home. The police are here. Okay. Okay. I'll go. Are you one of the secret officers? Or you fired again. To... Okay. Oh, I hear it. Oh, damn it. And that's okay, the end I'll of that. I'll go ahead yeah. and let officers um, handle that. Thank you. No problem. Mm-hmm. Bye. Okay, so that's how hap- that, that's how quick that happens. And and, and police it, officers are here. Boom, boom, boom. L- listen, and you're going to see why in a second. Uh, for those who are watching, I mean, it, 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 we'll try to describe it the best we can for the podcast. But um, it all happened in an instant. First of all, and uh, second of all, um, let, let's think of, of a couple things here too. The officer on the way to that call. The officer on the way to the call is is probably moving pretty rapidly. I, I don't know what time of night this is. I know it's it's, it's twelve fifteen in the morning. Okay, twelve fifteen in the morning. So there's the travel and 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 Lance Rowe has pointed out a few times that you know this is Austin, so things are a little bit different there. It's not a gun heavy community, although it is Texas, but it's a, it's a different part of Texas. I took a look at the at the neighborhood on 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 Google Earth. About 200 degrees around this duplex is all densely packed neighborhood. I would guess at 12:15, it's probably full of people. The other half of that duplex may have people in it. To the west is a stretch of looks like a grove of trees and then northwest is even a restaurant from there i'm not sure what the distance was or what the range of the rifle was but it's possible that there may have even been people at the restaurant in any case uh high velocity rounds are being fired in a potentially target dense area so we're we're an officer is reading this call over a little it's not even a you know maybe a 14 inch monitor in his car trying to maintain, trying to keep in between the, the yellow lines and um, trying to get there because it's a pretty serious call. With a guy, if there's a guy in the middle of the street with a rifle, it doesn't, whether he's protecting his domain or he's arguing with the neighbor, nobody knows, is this an active shooter or whatever? And you're reading what she's typing. Just remember that. So he only, we heard the full call and we had the whole full description from the caller that's not what he, that's not what the, the I would be very surprised if they heard man with a firearm outside a house if they even looked at their MDTs their their computers they were probably heading down their hot and listening to the radio dispatcher which is what's next probably so here's here's the radio traffic they said across the street at the G tax on second street subject pulled subject pointed a rifle towards the street subject now has the rifle down but still in his hands white male wearing a gray robe dark pants and surrounds with the gun other subject locations on second across in the street of 2301 units on the gun other subject is turning the outside all units open air i don't know if you caught that i think he said shots fired so I'm going to rewind that because I think that's what he said. Street of 2301. Other subject is turning the outside. All units open air. It's just, uh, more silence like what happened uh, shot taking suspect down i'm clear suspect's down hands are up i'm clear suspect down you're not giving commands i'm clear giving commands 
AR-15 is on the ground. I'm sir, AR-15 on the ground. EMS stage, we're moving up. Okay. So let's t talk about this for a second uh, because we're going to go to the ring video next. But this all happened in a flash. And, and like we were saying a second ago, John, um, you probably don't have all the. I, I'm guessing now that just based on the speed of all this and hearing the radio traffic, I think you're right. It, 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 there's a possibility that they may never have heard or may never have read the comments that that guy gave in his description now she, she did a the, the radio dispatcher did a great job she she described the guy to a t because she's relaying the information from the 911 call taker just remember that that takes time also right oh you're muted john <laughs> sometimes talking is difficult sometimes you're talking and you're listening at the same time where you're listening to the call you're broadcasting in a normal tone of voice like i'm talking right now and I'm giving out the address, you know, four, three, two, one. And I'm hearing on the on the phone line, I hear like, oh, he's got a gun in his hand all of a sudden. You know, and then I will say, you know, use caution. The suspect has a weapon, you know. So sometimes you're literally talking and listening and then telling what you just heard at the same time. So if you ha if you listen to the, the phone recording and then you uh, listen to the radio dispatcher, I would almost like to see those overlaid so that we could actually see the speed at which that was dispatched to police. Yeah, I'd like to see it overlaid too. I, we're going to see a version of it on uh, the body cam, but um, just just something, just a notion I want to kind of throw out there. Th there is a concept known as uh, dispatcher priming or dispatch priming. It's it's not meant to blame the dispatcher, but understand this: there there are certain quality controls with, built into a nine one one call, like they'll do QC or quality assurance <clears throat> assessments on these 911 calls after the fact, you know, at random sometimes to make sure that they're hitting certain benchmarks. Now, a call like this is a critical incident. I'm sure that somebody, a supervisor at some point somewhere went through this call and made sure that the 911 call, a uh, 911 operator asked all the right questions and then the radio dispatcher asked all the right questions. This is a slippery slope though, because this is what happened in, in my communication center back way back when uh, we did a QA assessment on somebody and, and th they ended up not asking about weapons in the house or whatever. So that just sometimes it, it becomes uh, like a very deliberate and um, um, literal message. So if you put an email out to 200 dispatchers that say, make sure you ask if there are weapons in the house, it's an officer safety issue they are going to ask if there are weapons in the house. Now, the problem with that is, is there was a call that went out that two roommates were fighting in the kitchen. Two roommates, two male roommates, they were just roommates, and they were fighting over the possessions of the, the apartment. One guy was moving and, and, and leaving. And so the dispatcher said, as she had been directed, are there any weapons in the house? And he says, yeah, I'm standing in the effing kitchen. We're fighting over a knife set because that's my, I bought it and you know, whatever. So what makes it into the call is there's a bunch of knives in there, right? Is she wrong? No. Is she um, fully descriptive? Maybe she doesn't have time. What is the officer reading and seeing on the way though? Men armed with knives having knife combat. Exactly. Like, which they're, means they're going to go in there and they're going to be ready to plug somebody because that's a lethal weapon. Now, if now if this if this you know kitchenware set is inside a cardboard box and they're fighting over it like little kids under a Christmas tree, that's a totally different situation. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be in a, you know I hate to use her so much, but it could be your aunt Sally's like cheese knife. You know what could I'm be. saying? And, and it's an heirloom, and that's what they're actually fighting over. But is, is she incorrect to say there's a knife in there? No, but, but it, in the, in the priming of this, like the thin slicing that your brain goes through as a cop, you're do like I said, you, you're doing everything you can to keep the car on the road. You're reading this tiny little screen and you're thinking, Oh shit, this says knives. It doesn't say knife. So yep. you're going, you're walking. They're in. undoing their holster as they're walking up. You're, you're darn right. And, and, and rightfully so sometimes, but this is, th this is how shootings happen. This is what happens, you know? So 
just just something else to think about. It, it's not really a huge factor in this call because of the the speed that this went down. Right. But if they're talking about if they're if you're having a picture painted to you of a guy roaming the streets wearing a gray robe with a rifle, you 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 already know something's off, and yeah. your mind is is in preservation mode before you even get there. So, yeah, what you're what you're talking about with the knives, I just call that the fog of war. That sometimes there's miscommunications, even when communications work perfectly, and someone just can't understand you, and it can have dire consequences. Okay, this is a very poignant video. This is the ring camera, and I want to talk a little bit about it at the end here. Yeah, go ahead and narrate it, Drew. Uh, he says stuff, so I don't want to step over him. You can see Christmas lights hanging there, and you can see the car that the guy described. He's on his porch, walking okay. back and forth. Now, I saw this in the chats a second ago. Oh, thank you, John, for I, I understand what you're saying. There's a Razor scooter in the corner. Uh, I saw in uh, in the chats a second ago that somebody mentioned that he was not a white male. And this is one of those tricky conundrums. You're, you're, you're going after what what a citizen is telling you. So you're typing that in. He was a Middle Eastern male, as it turned out. So for um the purposes of like fcic ncic there's five classes it's black white uh indian asian and other unknown uh, or unknown okay right so unknown so i'm a little out of practice so the thing is what category do you put this guy under to get enough description for the guy you understand what i'm saying so to, to call him a white male is this is one of those where it's close enough, but you're also having to rely on some citizens um, interaction with the guy and, and he's making the determination. This is a white male, right? So here we go. The guy is pacing back and forth. He has an AR 15. Uh, he does have a gray robe on. He just picked up the gun and pointed it out towards the street. Now he's tactically coming around the corner, back up the stairs and he's yeah. pointing the gun to back in his house. You want that? He says, Hey, you want this? He's pointing the gun to someone or something in the house. He's now sighting. He's now looking through the sights. Okay. And he's just, he's pointing his gun and something. Sure? Listen you, to him. Listen to him talk. Okay. So he drops the rifle down to, uh, to his side. He said, and, and bear in mind, if we overlaid the 911 call, this is exactly what the guy is describing. And he was like, oh yeah, he's back on his porch now. He's pointing the gun in the house. And listen to what the, the guy says. He's going back and forth, too, from high ready to just holding it at his side. Are you sure? He said, are you sure? He asked, he asked whatever's on the other side of that door or whatever he's pointing at, are you ready for this or something to that effect? And he's like, are you sure? And then we'll take it from here. Oh, my God. You're fucking stupid. You're fucking stupid. Okay, he's got the, the rifle raised again. He's looking through the sights. That's fired. All right. I don't know if you caught that on the video. I want to, I want to, I can't stress this enough. The instant that that gunshot went off, you'll see nothing but a bunch of dust fly. That's very common on video. You, you see those like snow flurry looking things. And you hear the engine rev of a of a police vehicle and in the background you see bright tail lights they almost drove past it i mean which it, is it, which, I, what i'm saying is the cop was was in the area and he heard this the gun which made him slam on the brakes okay i'm going to rewind it to the point where he had just fired the gun I, i've got it queued up i'm going to press play in a second here but you can see the little streams on the screen of where he had just fired the gun. And then let's, let's look at where the officer was when that happened. I mean, he's, he's pulled into the frame already and the guy is not looking out at the street. He's looking inside the house. So he doesn't even know the officers there. Okay. And the officer's obviously not out of his, out of his car, the vehicle's still in motion. So here we go. Uh, Everybody is out of frame at this point. A second officer has already arrived. Okay, this is in real time. Second shot goes off. Now, what happens is the subject walks out, and he is now facing the road. And he has still got his finger on the trigger, and 
he's ready to raise that rifle at whatever he sees on the street. And that's when you hear the officer yell, drop the gun. He's, he, he's, he probably has like a 10% view of this guy, but he's no, he knows what's going on. He just watched him shoot into the house. And we'll talk about uh, castle doctrine and stuff in a second, but watch this. Officer hits him with first or second shot there, Drew. Open me. Fuck. Perfect down and rough. It wasn't me. Do it now. It wasn't me. Hey, come guys, come guys. Yeah. Okay, what he's when the officer is saying, come to us, come to us, there's already a third officer that's there. He had, he was down the street. Yeah. He had run up with his yeah, rifle. And, his and practically speaking, he's pinned to the right. So if the guy gets the, the rifle and gets back up, he's going to point it that way. Or uh, they don't want to be, they, they don't want to create a crossfire situation. So he's saying, get in behind us basically. Mm-hmm. And then watch what they do from here or listen. Okay. Ready? They formed up. And they moved tactically, tactically as if it were an active shooter in an element, a single element. Mm-hmm. One guard up. in the front, two at the flanks, and they just walk up and handle business. Yep, traversing to the left to cover them as they 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 cut the they're slicing the pie as they go around the the the, por- the excuse me the corner of his porch. He's slightly out of out of view off to the right, and as they come around that angle, you know, more and more of that pie is revealed to them as they come around. He's been shot. The weapon is down out of his hands when he starts screaming, it wasn't me. Okay, this is uh, Daniel Sanchez. He's an, a police officer, and uh, this is his body-worn camera video. They've grayed out his uh, MDT. He charges his rifle. Tell the gun! And he fires his three or three times. Four times. Right? David, three or nine shots taken, suspect down. So that's that's what you hear on the radio. Shots taken, suspect down. Now, there may be questions about the expediency of of why he got out of the gu- uh, car with his with his gun and why he uh, shot without warning, basically. And I, I'll tell you, my, the procedure in the agency that I worked for was you are uh, you should give a verbal warning before you use deadly force when it's when you can when it's available when it's an option Mm -hmm. it's not mandatory though no you're not you're not just going to wait for him to be lucky and get off a shot before you can say anything right and and here's this is what we we have to consider here and it and it's unfortunate that 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 it turned out this way um because i do think that this was a deep deep deep-rooted mental health problem like i think he was having a psychotic episode he was probably seeing whatever he was seeing inside that apartment or condo or whatever it is. And it didn't exist. There was nothing there, but I, I I believe that he was seeing it. I believe that he was shooting at, but he, um, but the officer does not have time to react because let's, let's remember as he was pulling up, he, he literally heard and saw the guy firing into the condo. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and it's a duplex that we presume to be occupied at this point. So for all we know, he just shot somebody. Sure. And the point of uh, any use of deadly force situation or, or the, the criteria is uh, the threat of uh, the imminent threat of death or great bodily harm to yourself or to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Now, is this guy an imminent threat of death or great bodily harm to somebody else? He just shot into a condo. Obviously he is. If it turns out later that this was all just a big misunderstanding and he was shooting an intruder, there's going to be egg on the face, but the, but there's no choice in a situation like this. When you see a guy shooting somebody and then he presents to you, it's game over. Well, if, if there's a burglar inside the house, there's egg on everybody's faces because he's responding entirely inappropriately for a responsible gun owner to the case of someone uh, burglarizing your home. I mean, there's always extra circumstances like, do you have a family member in there that's at risk? Has a shot already been fired at you? You know, I I don't want to go into all of the permutations of what could be going on, but based on what the officer has arriving on scene, a man shot a gun into a house. That's what he has. 
And as Abby points out in the chat, the officer can't know what's on this guy's mind. He, he, th- there's no ESP uh, when it comes to police work. You, you just, you don't know what people are thinking. And, 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 you know, this is happening. We're talking about in a matter of four or five seconds, he, he rolls up and sees a guy. He already knows the guy's got a rifle. He, he matches the description. The guy's firing the rifle as he, as he just think of the, Oh shit getting out of your car with your rifle, charging it, moving to a good cover position as he did behind a fence. I mean, although, you know, it's a wood fence, so it's not the greatest, but it's something. And um, what are you thinking at that point? The guy's, the guy turned around. You can see very clearly on the ring camera. He turned around with the gun. He still had his finger on the trigger. Um, At this point, your mind is probably thinking kill or be killed at this point. So let's, we'll watch the conclusion of his body worn camera. Suspects down, hands are up. Show us your hands, do it now! You good? Yeah, I'm good. Three and nine, hey, come to hands. us, come to us. Yeah. Guns hey, on the ground. Teens on the ground. Okay, you ready? Move up, move. Have EMS stage, we're moving up. You good, Daniel? I'm good. Okay. From a tactical standpoint, you could not have asked for a more tactically sound response. Oh, oh, it's right. unfortunate that this is not the but they were fast as a burrito. No, a whole lethal. They moved to the threat. Awesome, the threat was on the ground. The rifle was laying next to him. So now one. This, this, you know, I'm not here to pick these guys apart, but one is going inside to to see what what's going on inside. Yeah, he, yeah, they're they're holding lethal on him on the ground. Yeah. They, don't, they don't know if he still has a, a pistol on him somewhere. They've got to get him secured. But they presume that he also may be firing at somebody armed inside the house. So they move. Uh, the third officer goes inside and sort of makes sure that they're not going to get ambushed from inside the house. We're, you can also hear an, uh, plenty of sirens coming. They've got help on the way, so they kind of just need to. Yeah, that's the sound of freedom when when you're in an intense situation like that. Yeah. Just you'll hear it in a second. Hook him, hook him, hook him. You get it? Hook him off the cover, okay? Yep. Yeah. Roll over on your stomach, buddy. So we can help you roll on your stomach. So we can help you. He's 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 having trouble. He's having trouble. Uh, he he didn't say on his body cam he's wiped out. He's dead. He said he's having trouble. So, um, they already, we already know through the dispatch that he said, if EMS is staging or if fire, if rescue is staging, send them on, like get, get them up here. Mm-hmm. So I, I heard him say stage, which they would need to do until they were, they definitely had him in custody. Um, until you secured the house of any other shooters too. That's um, true. This is something you see in a lot of movies is you'll see paramedics and firefighters running into a dangerous situation, but as a dispatcher, you would never do that. Uh, we do have a, a, there is such a thing as basically, I guess what you would call almost a combat medic. We do have ambulance companies here who have ballistic armor and things like that, but generally you wouldn't send them into a hot zone or a red zone or any, any place where they could get hurt. You want to secure anyone that's an element of danger to them. <laughs> Yeah, we're good. Here's the other officer's body cam. We'll just take a look at this real quickly, just to again reiterate the the point. This is this is the second guy that arrived. <laughs> it all goes down. He's arrived. He Control shots fired. He's already here in the other officer shooting. Where's he? Goes to where the other officer where is he? shooting, and he gets right on his flank. And he's asking, okay. "Where is he? Where is he?" Suspects down, hands are up. Great communication. Uh, I, I mean, you know, and and so, John, maybe you, uh, we don't even really need to show the third body cam. It's available to you on YouTube. By the way, I took this, uh, this information from the Austin PD's um, YouTube channel. It's available to you. It's available for anyone. We, we're, we're not, uh, you know, uh, we're not showing it for any other purpose than education or to discuss it, but um, we can put the link down in, in the comments. Uh, but, um, just, it, 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 this is how fast these things happen. And, and, and so when you get the, the edited ring video where it's, <laughs> they, they slow motion, the defendant 
to make it look like he was walking even slower than he was or they um, also take out the the entire audio of him you know berating whoever's inside and calling him stupid going from high ready and then dropping the gun down to his side which if you think that there's a guy inside your house that you need to be having a, a gun at you're not going to lower this down once you're already at this point you're committed you're either going to shoot or you're going to or, he, or he's not really there, I guess, is what ended up happening. But you're not going to go back and forth like this if you're in a deadly force situation. I, I think I, I think it really lends to, um, and I'm not a doctor, obviously, but this psychotic episode, like he's going through some type of like psychosis. Uh, I sent a video to Andrea because she is fascinated with the brain and with mental health and, and, and such, you know, stuff like that. Um, there was a guy that I, I watched a YouTube video that filmed his, uh, he was going through a psychotic episode. Like he had, I don't know if he'd been off his meds or whatever, but he felt it coming on. So he recorded it. Then he also did a second one, uh, like an update that got a couple million views or whatever. He also got a second one where his girlfriend was sitting with him. It was fascinating. Because he, he, you just, you see him like he's talking, he's like, I'm normal, but I'm, I know I'm slipping. I'm, I'm feeling it. Like I'm feeling it coming on. And, and he's just, his, his girlfriend is completely talking him through it. Like, Hey, look at me. It's a, everything's fine. And he's like, well, what about them? You know, like who, who do you mean? The guy in the closet. There's nobody in the closet. You're, it's just you and me here. We're, it's just us and you're going to be fine. Like, totally disconnected and it doesn't doesn't take much and and to him it's real that's what's most important you know when you're especially if you're talking to someone like this and they believe that there's someone in their closet and there's not or whatever the situation is right. you have to you have to address what they're telling you is real even if you know you don't necessarily believe it so it does you no good like in a, in a situation where you're able to at least negotiate it does you no good to berate or belittle somebody who's you know oh he's cuckoo he's seeing things or particularly you know, since their feelings are real even if what they're reacting to is not right and and so um you know i i, I don't think there are any do-overs in this i mean i i think that the, this is uh you know this is a, a a bigger conversation for some other time about um you know the status of this guy's mental health and how he obtained a, an R, ar-15 it's a it's the second amendment that he's allowed to just just like any other citizen but this yeah. is th either he obtained it illegally or he's never been adjudicated as a being unfit for a firearm or maybe this is just we're all unlucky and it's his first time and it's also texas but th this is this is what they're talking about this is this is the argument for the other side so to speak i'm not i'm not taking any side in this i i'm taking the side of uh, of sadness because this guy had a mental health breakdown and he felt that he was under threat and he picked up a rifle if that's actually what happened and he picked up a rifle and you know thankfully no officers were hurt but but he was shot and killed and he's a human being and and you know who counter argue who, okay. that though is that that he's shooting into a duplex for all we know he should she sh shot a high velocity around through his own house and into the crib of his neighbor right i mean so we're, we're lucky that his neighbors didn't get shot so it also begs the question too how does the media portray this what does the media say about this? I mean, like you, you'll look that I, I pulled it off of the official government website of Austin PD. But if you if you search this case on NBC.com or, or, you know, not to single out any network, but if you search this case anywhere else, what do you think the headline is? It's it's not like you know, man has psychotic episode and, no. and dumbly, you know, loving brother, loving husband, entrepreneur, brilliant man with future in front of him, you he, know, taken out by a police officer. And he probably was all those things. He was a millionaire, by the way. Uh, uh, that's one sure. of the headlines I've read. You know, as soon as you, you go straight to, you know, the bologna and the sandwich where you cut to the family and they're crying, I don't want to deny the, the sadness that they have. And certainly that's a good human interest story. But it used to be that our human interest stories were at the end of the broadcast. They weren't right there being presented right with the facts of everything that happened. And the speed at which it's happening. Uh, I, I do see Abby in the in the uh, chat say uh, one, one headline here. Family of Texas entrepreneur fatally shot by police uh, say he was defending his home. And, and that's exactly what the family should perceive. He probably felt like he was defending his home, but I, I don't know that we're going to fault the police for this. And, okay. and 
Hey, what but, do you do? Fault the 911 caller who's concerned that this guy is walking around in a robe with a yeah. AR-15 up and down the Austin city streets? I mean, well, I mean, it, but it also just opens up your castle doctrine. Okay, so you're inside a house. You can use a firearm to defend yourself if someone's coming inside. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not sure that if you're outside your house and you're not in any kind of imminent danger that you can take a rifle and start firing inside. Right. And you're responsible for wherever you shoot. So just keep that in mind. That's, you're absolutely right. So media bias plays into this and, and it, it, it creates the national conversation. Uh, and this is, this is like not to lament or go on forever and ever, but this is how we become unsafe because the media is just pushing this narrative that police are just reckless. They just fire at entrepreneurs who are family men, uh, just simply defending their home, not considering the threat. Mm -hmm. And then when the big one happens in St. Uh, when the big one happens in Memphis, it just, it's, it's like they point to this and say, see, we, we told you that they're just, they're all just brutal, ruthless thugs. Well, you know, it's, it's a whole narrative that they have. That was the premise of this whole show, you know, in 2021 was the anti-police sentiment and those things are going to continue to happen. And as long as it's politi politically expedient, and as long as it sells commercials for CNN, they're always going to jump on that. And let's face it. Somebody's getting rich off of that narrative too. We're going to get, we're going to, we're going to very boldly try to take one phone call, maybe two. Hang on one second. I'd like to encourage you, if you're a police officer and you think that this was an excessive use of force, definitely call us. We're not going to, you don't have to give your name or do anything. Just hey. come on the air and explain. Well, go ahead, Jen, IG girl. You're on the air. Can you, can everybody hear Jen? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, excellent. Um, I don't know that you guys have time to take, like answer my question in full um but i legitimately was wondering and we talked somewhat about it in the chat about situational awareness and how people react differently in emergencies and it's this is something i've been thinking about since i don't know last february when i had to deal with a medical emergency situation while i was in vegas um and the person who was calling 911 really didn't know, like was younger and just had no idea what she was saying and was just really freaked out and okay. all of that. Um, what are the most, the first three important things that a caller to 911 needs to know and communicate? And then what is the second three most important things? Okay, the, and let's say this is for a medical emergency. The first. Uh, and that, that is my question. Okay, great. The first three things, and John, you should probably answer all, all six, but I, I, I could say that the, above all, not to steal your thunder, John, it, is to listen and answer the questions that are being asked of you because you're being asked for a very, very specific reason. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, listening and the, what's being said is going to determine the next question. So you, ha you have to kind of take over to and, you know, direct your questioning as appropriate. So it's entirely situational. Can, can you hear John, by the way? Oh, I totally cannot hear John, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll go back and listen to his answer. No, hold on one second. He's going to switch over to AM mode. This is This is what we... <laughs> This is the system and product that we've perfected. Can you hear me, Jen? Can you hear me, Jen? Oh. I can hear you now, John. Okay, so when you take a 911 call, you have no idea what it's going to be, but you have to keep an yeah. open mind. Keep an open mind. Stop, you have echo. Mm -hmm. He's going to either fix the echo or... We're... Hold on one sec. Hold on one sec. He's, he can do it. There we go. No more echo. Apologize to everyone on the download. Jen, when you take a 911 call, you have no idea what it's going to be. And you, first thing you really need to establish is where it's at. A lot of times the details of what's going on and what that person's going through, it's all secondary. Because suppose we lose contact with that. So we lose touch with that person. Well, at least I know there's a 911 emergency at 123 Main Street. And from there, I can establish the chief complaint. And then I can re-dispatch let uh, responders, the appropriate responders know what's going on. And I continue to gather information as you go. So it's entirely contextual. Every answer that they give you is going to determine your next step. 
right? And 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 the, <laughs> I think the most important thing out of all of this is how are you going to know how how are the responders going to respond if they don't know where to go? So it's, it's all a matter of just listening to the, it, it, and, and maybe this would benefit the public to know most call centers have some type of protocol, like on their computer screen, or they have a flip chart or they have something in front of them that's required that, that is giving all the required questions. Like, you know, okay, ask them their name, ask them their phone number, ask them the nature of the emergency. If it's this, then go this route. If it's that, it's like a, it's like a game of dragon's lair. If, if anybody remembers that from the uh, 1900s, yeah. as my stepson would say. So um, it, it's, it truly is situational, Jen. It's, it's kind of hard to answer that uh, very specifically, but I, I think the best answer I can give is just, just listen to what the dispatcher is asking you and answer it because there's also there are also methods and techniques that the dispatcher has to keep you at a level of calm or at least extract the, the right information out of you in between you know your episodes and fits of screaming which are very common uh, very 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 common on 911 calls it's very tough because everyone wants yeah, to tell us so it really sounds like and, and it was a unique situation because we all everybody was on vacation and we were at a resort in a town we didn't know And so it sounds like the most important thing, wherever you are, is to kind of know where you are and have main um, markers sort of in your head that the dispatcher may recognize. Yes, that's that's a great system. That's a great way to do it. Or at least... Um, and again, it gets back to answering their questions because what, what they'll do, what a dispatcher will do is, uh, or what an emergency call taker do is they'll go through a series of questions and try to narrow down where you are. So like, are you at the mm-hmm. beach? Are you, uh, when you look out, do you see anything? Yes. I see a McDonald's. Okay. You're near McDonald's. What's next door to the McDonald's? There's a seven. Mm-hmm. Ah, could you be on us 301? Yeah, I think that's it. I think we were on us 301. Okay, great. Now we can get somebody going. So again, it's just kind of a like just a uh, systematic, um, you know, the, the call, the call taker, the emergency call taker knows the drill. They know what to go through to try to get you to answer the right questions. Thanks for the call, Jen. You're uh, fantastic. You're a, Thank you guys. Y'all are rocking it. Oh, I appreciate it. You're always great in the chats. Uh, get back there and, and tame those people and, uh, Tell them to hit like and subscribe. Remember, like uh, and subscribe, John says. If, if you want to support the show, like and subscribe on Spotify. Bye, y'all. What helps us the most is when you download these podcasts. So please, by all means, if you get a chance to and you're in the uh, Best Buy and you're looking at all the Apple products, make sure that you subscribe all of those Apple products. Go to ahead me. and fill them up with downloads. Too. <laughs> fill them up with downloads. Illegal. I don't know. <laughs> Check your local ordinances before you do that. <laughs> right, right. I'm not... I'm not suggesting you do it. I'm ordering that you do that. So it's we have Hydro Man. a lawyer before you do it and then do it. John switched to AM mode. We have Hydro Man Blue who said he was going to hang out and wait for us to bring him on just to say hello. And Hydro Man, I'm wondering, has the flagpole situation been rectified? Poor Hydro Man has passed away. Apparently he is deceased, unfortunately. Um, I'm alive. Oh my well, goodness, he's been revived. Hello. I did not hear I did not hear the tone. That's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> y'all are you know, some high paying high paid celebrities. You might want to get that fixed. You do right. Y'all well you do you pay issues, our salary and you also no, pay for that my tone. Flag issue. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. You do pay our salaries and you do pay for that tone and we will get that fixed. I think it was just a matter of uh, there was a a uh, a towel on the bell, so you probably didn't hear it. It just kind of deadened the sound. Hey, Hydro. Okay, I understand. I understand. No, the, the, the flag problem is it's, it's escalating. It's escalating. <laughs> It's starting to play mind games with me now. Right. I, I can completely understand that and empathize with you. Uh, is the flag illuminated this evening? And if so, what color? It Does is he know he's doing a frequent a flyer red bit? Light. The lighting is underneath it. 
It shouldn't be um, above it. A flagpole that is now less than 16 feet tall. I d- <laughs> cut it down. I know. I know that there is an issue with the height of the flagpole. Hydraman, you win the, uh, once again, you will be the recipient of the Drew Breezy bookmark for the evening. I appreciate you calling. Um, we always appreciate everybody calling and let me put one last special guest on somebody who's fallen on hard times, but never gets down uh, a rambling man by the name of Bosco. How are you doing tonight? I'm very blessed brothers. Everybody in the, how are you, man? How are y'all doing tonight? We couldn't be better. I just, hey, bye. <clears throat> what's going on, brother? What's I, up? um, I seriously, and I was talking to dead leg, but I really want to put this out there that I am almost overwhelmed with emotions of how much love and support that I got over this last week. And, you know, not only, not even about my loss of job, <laughs> but over my wife being sick and uh, she's doing a lot better today. Thank God. And just good. just being a part of this thing that's bigger than anything I've ever experienced. Uh, I, I mean, Bosco, I, I, I can't show I, an, an appreciation, man. Yeah, we're, we're, we're rooting for you. We're always in your corner. And if, if there's anything we could do to help, we are definitely going to do that. So uh, we are glad that your wife is doing better. And um, I understand that there may be some job prospects on the horizon for you. And if not, please, and if you're in central Georgia and you know someone that needs a good diesel mechanic, Bosco is your man. We have Abby on the line who wants to talk about media bias. Good evening, Abby. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. John, go to AM mode so you can talk to Abby as well. Hey, Abby, good to talk to you. Guys, great job. I was on the seat of my chair listening to that. A wonderful breakdown. Very thorough, very thoughtful. Here's what I want to address. You were amazing. Thank you. You are amazing. (laughs) The headline, he did nothing wrong. Family of a Texas entrepreneur fatally shot by police as he was defending his home, okay? The headline isn't man shooting a gun in front of his house contacted by police who are forced to use deadly force because the guy's shooting a gun off in front of his house. As you so accurately said, John, you cannot just stand around shooting a gun that may hit other people in other people's homes. The officers cannot show up knowing this guy thinks he is defending his home. So, you know, the way the media portrays this and the facts don't line up. This is the, and this is why I I still say your role is so important in this. Abby, Abby interviews cops. She's a civilian who took an interest and she's, she's doing something about it to bridge the gap between the community and law enforcement. And, And this is why it's so important because you know what the other, you know what the alternative article or the alternative headline is? Austin police ignore several 911 calls of man walking in street with rifle. So it just, it implies that Austin police cannot win. Uh, you know, and, and of course I just made that article up on a whole cloth. It's fictitious, but you're right, Abby. I mean, what what are they supposed to do? It, it's always told from the perspective of the family, which I get. I, I completely understand. But it has taken, it, it sheds bad and negative light on the police who were literally called to protect the other citizens. Are you there? Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, the guy is standing there shooting a gun so what are the police supposed to do let me wait and see if he shoots again you know he's shooting a gun right (laughs) so anyway let let me beg him to put this thing down and and be kind of gentle and i and i do get like you know i think that there probably was very valid concerns that this was uh this this all unfolded too quickly but i think i think the lesson to be learned is yes 
it, it, it unfolds that quickly. And, and the officer made a decision and, and it probably saved his life. It may have saved other people's lives. We don't know. We, we don't know. Maybe the guy would have recognized the police officer and put his gun down. We don't, we'll never have that, that chance, right. Right. but, but you can't, you know, until you have all the, you can't, unless you have some kind of time machine to, to run it back. We'll never know. There's also there's also no use of force policy that's going to make every situation just work out. It doesn't work that way in real life. You can't write down some kind of rule that's going to prevent every bad thing from happening. Everything a police officer does is so high stakes that sometimes it's just going to turn out bad, even when everything goes right. Well, Abby, you're a champion. Well, thank you, guys. You're a champion for the cause. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for calling. And as always, thank you for your support. Uh, we look forward to your uh, future episodes of On Being a Police Officer. It's uh, a great show. It is a great show. And John is back in FM mode. And you know what that means? That means it's about time to wrap it up. Uh, I think we had a tremendous breakdown. I saw very active chats. Lasfro Lopez has a very veiled message to a former uh, wife who is now a dispatcher. Uh, and Tactical dual Dude is here. Andrea up late is always always uh in support of us katie k is here uh you know i just see a bunch of people imperial girls always here uh, she was on the show yeah we cannot stress how important it is for Brittany faulkner to have her me time with john and drew as she prepares dinner and hopefully in silence uh as the young child is probably crying out and by young child i mean her husband so lumber chef is here i'm always happy to see lumber chef uh, and for anybody else that joined us, don't forget, you can call us at 848-COM-911. That's 848-266-6911. Leave us a voicemail. Hopefully, we'll get to it next week. We are going to wrap this up for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. Please tell all of your friends, like and subscribe, uh, download the podcast, give your Aunt Sally a kiss goodnight. And until next time. Thanks for your love and support. Let's keep it going strong. John, don't leave. I'm not leaving. I'm sticking around. Good night, everyone else. Good night. Bye.